As always, our show is sponsored by Memoria Press. You can find our curriculum at memoriapress.com. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. All right, well, welcome back to another episode of Classical Etc. Take two. The casual version. Less casual than take one. That's yeah, right. so this is their second attempt at recording this episode for those who are not privy to the things that happen off air because they're building a second studio because of all of the incredible content that's being produced at Memorial Press. And so sometimes there are people with hammers hammering during your show and you can't record while that's happening apparently. What was interesting to me was that rather than Bryce asking them to quit, he asked us to quit because right. he wants the studio yeah. more than that's he right. really wants us to do a podcast. <laughs> you know where we are. And Bryce you know shakes his head now. in pain. <laughs> well, on today's episode, we're going to be talking about pedagogy. And my goal for this conversation is to spark a fierce argument slash fight between Tanya and Martin. That's kind of what I hope will happen here. Even though I think actually we all agree at this table and it's a matter of emphasis, the goal for me is that you guys would fight. I just want Martin to complete his thoughts. Good, good start. They're, they're long involved. <laughs> well, they need to so be they completed. Take some time. And this is why completed. we have... An hour and a half before Tanya's hair appointment. Oh, yes. Is to really <laughs> dig into all of this. <laughs> okay. I That's see right. Now. Because I um, cannot go into the conference with gray hair. Wait, I thought you had an appointment the yesterday. The rest of when us we are doing it. Tried to film the subversion. No. Do you have another one today? No, no. <laughs> Two hair appointments no. in a row? No, it was today, but when we were rescheduling the podcast because of the hammering, is where the hair appointment came up. Yeah. Now, before we get to this battle royale around classical <laughs> pedagogy, I'm interested in hearing what you guys have been reading recently. We we haven't talked in a little while. I haven't been on here for a while. Yeah. So I just need to catch up a little bit. We haven't talked to each other about anything except for conference related activities. I did re I did recognize something today though. You know, Lee made me read all the Lord of the Rings books, which And you finished all of them. No, I'm not through with the third one. I quit in the middle because we everybody was too busy getting ready for the conference. Mm -hmm. And so I've got like, I got them through uh, Aragorn coming and saving the day yeah. with the dead people. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert. And so, oh, I'm probably the only person that has not read them. Well, and if you've, if you've seen the movie, you realize that they took a pretty strong left turn Mm -hmm. In terms of their decision, creative decision making about that that particular point. Oh, I don't remember that. But um, so I've got that last part left. We still have to get rid of the ring. But I thought I'd wait on that until Lee's closer to ready for the next one, so sure. I don't forget it all. But the amazing thing I recognized was when I was getting the door prizes ready over in the gym for the conference for you to give away. I didn't have to think again. Which Lord of the Rings book goes first? Oh. Which one's second and which is third? That's growth. Because I had read them. Wow. So I knew the Fellowship they of the Rings. They were in order there. On they the, were. The, table, the Fellowship, right? and then it breaks up, and then we go to the Two Towers, and then finally the Return of the King. So, Donnie, let me ask you this question. What would I have to give to you to make it worth it for you to read The Silmarillion? Oh, no, please, not another <laughs> I, one. I don't think she needs to read the summer. I don't I either. I'm reading Oliver Twist. Okay. And um, it Dickens is such a nice, it's all, you know, it's all human beings. Right. Even the bad characters are human. Sure. So it's a nice breath of fresh air for me. That sounds like Lord of the Rings to me. No. Uh, a lot no. of them are dwarves and That's exactly dwarves what they and are. goblins. They're, 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 they're uh, they're versions of human beings. That's true. Refracted mm -hmm. human beings. Martin, what have you been reading recently? Um, well, I'm, um, I'm still reading Lorna Doone uh, in, in terms of my fiction. And then I've been reading Philip Reef's The uh, Triumph of the Therapeutic, hmm. which is one of those great books. I put it on my top five list of books that explain why things are the way they are hmm. uh, in our culture. Um, basically sort of teasing out the implications, the cultural implications of, of Freud's psychology. Uh, he talks about, you know, Freud's disciples and one a sort of right-wing disciple, the other sort of left-wing disciple, mm -hmm. and how their thought has pervaded everything. Now, a lot of the things, mischief, 
we attribute to Freud is actually things that his his disciples sure. were responsible for. But it's a, just an excellent book. Oh, interesting, Paul. Have you been reading anything Freudian recently? Uh, definitely <laughs> not. Uh, I actually haven't been reading much at all because I wake up, have to go out, take care of all of the animals since we're in the height of the summer. And then I run to work and I go home. And take care of the animals. And I take care of the animals. And the animals do not go to bed until 930. So by that point, it's time for me to go to bed too. And I just kind of crash. So uh, well, why do but, you feel like you should be giving all these excuses for not <laughs> well, here's the thing. I feel like I should be reading every day. And while I do, I mean, do you feel, do you feel guilty? Something. Yes, I feel guilty, Martin. <laughs> but have anything to do what with I am parents? part of as, as Is Arthur coming Martin. coming from your Freudian book? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> as Arthur Martin puts it, I'm part of the landed aristocracy. So therefore, <laughs> I, have, I have responsibilities. I can't sit there start smoking cigars and talking about philosophy all night long as Martin does. Um, <laughs> which I find funny. I've, I've really loved Arthur's comment about that. Um, but Arthur's an online academy teacher, so just bringing things full circle here. But I did you can sign up now for class. A little, mar- a little marketing, <laughs> a little marketing. <laughs> um, I was at ACCS's conference recently and eight day books was there and I was in the middle of this, like I don't have time to read. And so as I was going through their booth, which is always very, very dangerous for me, uh, I found two books. I found a, a, a uh, anthology of, well, complete version of Graham Greene short stories. Mm-hmm. And the guy you mentioned, was it de, de Balzac, the French dude? Is Balzac, that his? Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I found a compilation of his short stories, and I thought I could, re- I could find time to read 15 mm. pages and read a short story. I bought the books. I have not read a short story mm. yet. But, you know, it's it's so it's sitting stuff. there. You know, yeah. Paul, Duke Sr. in As You Like It says that there's more to read in nature than in any book that's ever been written. So, there you're, you you're go. Fine. You have Shakespeare on your side. Okay, thank you. See, mm-hmm. I have no guilt, Martin. What are you yeah. reading? So, because of the amount of scorn I've taken from you all. <laughs> For not reading fiction. On this show. <laughs> I have just really turned over a new leaf and read a lot of fiction. I am on p- chapter 116 of Moby Dick. I'm just cruising oh, through that's it. That's right. Mm. And really enjoying it. I, I was like, I loved it for the first 40 or so chapters. And I still really like it, but I, I was such shocked by how much I liked it. Just a person who's obsessed with something and just going into every bit of it, but then bringing in metaphysics and humor. And mm-hmm. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I'm also, I also picked up the myth of Sisyphus. By Albert okay. Camus. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, the, the ultimate question of the book is, should we, as honest people, commit suicide or procreate? Mm. And since I had already just had my first child, I now am kind of analyzing that decision <laughs> to see if I made the right one or not. So, uh. yeah, it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting book. He's he's a philosopher, but really a a poet in some ways too. So, very interesting. Mm. Yeah, we're proud of you. Thank you. You're reading <laughs> a you, lot. You don't feel guilty then? No, I feel no guilt. Because you've jealous. been reading. Yeah. I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. But you listen to audiobooks I when do. you're... So the no, I'm Dick, talking I, to Paul. Oh. Excuse me. I do. I do. <laughs> Who cares uh, what I do? <laughs> <laughs> I do listen to audiobooks. Still getting, but you can't but, do that while you're feeding animals? I can. Sometimes I do. But sometimes, as Shane points out, um, since I want to read the book of nature, I just decide to walk out well, and that's not right. be listening to anything. That's right. Just a um, nice little contemplative sun mm-hmm. coming up. Mm-hmm. It's and a beautiful time. So, sometimes you need to be able to hear that. Yes. cow that's over there mooing and you're like what's wrong or the pig birds. squealing or the birds chirping the crippled mm-hmm. pig the crippled pig no mm-hmm. it's not crippled anymore he's back with his buddies oh good yeah. and so i do care that you're listening to moby Thank dick you. on audiobook oh wait that. Does, that was audiobook yeah that's okay mm-hmm. okay yeah it's very good and it's on his read commute. extremely well and that's part of i think why i've enjoyed it so much but turning our attention to pedagogy paul i actually want to kick it to you first and ask you, what is pedagogy? Like, what is this term? Before I give them a chance to bicker about it, mm. like the old friends that they are, <laughs> I, I'm interested first to hear what it is so we know, have our bearings in this conversation. I have to, I have to choose my words wisely because if I don't, if I don't choose them wisely, they're going to jump on you're, me you're instead of jumping on each other. Right? Which could yeah. happen anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, How do I want to phrase this? Because Martin's over there. If I say method, oh, I think that's a trigger word. 
It is uh, a trigger word for him. Yeah. Can we just give Paul three minutes just to tell us what the term even is talking about <laughs> first? Um, no, I think, I mean, pedagogy has to do with the, uh, I think the presentation and techniques that a teacher uses to communicate ideas to the students. And so um, I think the question when we're asking about classical pedagogy is, is there a particular way in which the student ought to be presented with this information? I would say yes. Well, I think your, your, <laughs> your very definition of pedagogy there assumed a, a classical traditional view, that, that the purpose of pedagogy was to transmit knowledge. Well, that's one of the things that's in question. So yeah. explain yourself, uh, Mar. What I mean, would in you, modern, what would you say? modern pedagogy is is it should all pedagogy should be directed that way. But the, one of the problems with modern pedagogy is they're not focused on passing on things. They're they're focused on psychological concerns and child development and and this sort of thing. They 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 believe that pedagogy, in a way, is its own end. Well, well, but wouldn't they make the argument that the reason they're focused on all of that is at the end, to actually transmit something to them. So, so well, sort of like you teachers' colleges, right? We, we sometimes rail against them saying, well, they don't, they're not actually teaching the teacher any content to pass on. They're sort of assuming that knowledge based on their general they education may credits. Be, they may want to be tra- uh, passing on attitudes. They may want to be passing on certain values. They may, uh, but knowledge is is the redheaded stepchild of modern education. I mean, they, they this is this is what all of uh, E.D. Hirsch's writings are about is is trying to put knowledge back uh, in, 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 into its place of importance. So, so my, my definition was the right one then. Well, you give us the right one, <laughs> but you can't, that's not, if we're looking for a value neutral definition of pedagogy, that you gave the classical traditional view of pedagogy. Yeah, but, but we're not looking for a value neutral definition well, of pedagogy. Th- that's right? fine, but then you can't talk about the 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 you know progressive view of that of that because the that that you gave was already assumes the traditional so, view. Martin, if you were asked what is pedagogy, how would you answer the question? Pedagogy, I, I I like to talk about big pedagogy and little pedagogy. Okay, big pedagogy is uh, the theories about. Uh, 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 the purpose of pedagogy and how it should be done. Little pedagogy is all the things that we talk about in terms of classroom practices and, you know, um, how how things should be transmitted to students. Um, so it's just basically the, it, and we can use method in this regard. I mean, as, as a, it's the method by which we accomplish the purpose of education. I think your the problem that I had with you just saying that pedagogy wasn't important was that you you didn't follow it up with, you're going to say you didn't say that. I've heard <laughs> you say it more than once. <laughs> you're, but, but what you leave out is that n- the passing on of knowledge is central and that that is the most important thing. But then what I would say is that the way you do that is central because if you don't have an ordered classroom, if you don't have students sitting facing the teacher, if you don't have all of those things, then you're not spending your time on task the way that you should, and you're not going to get as much done. We are in agreement that passing on knowledge is the, that's what we're doing. As teachers, we're passing on knowledge to students. And what that knowledge is, is absolutely important. But I would say, and I think you would agree with me, that the way we do that needs to be in an ordered, classical, traditional way so that we can get it done. Well, I, I've been accused of of overstating things or saying things for shock value is when I titled Cheryl Lowe's article on how you should study history in a particular non-chronological order. I said, I titled it, History is Not Chronological. And part of the purpose of that is to stun the listener into receptivity to my ideas. And so my comment that classical educators didn't care all that much about pedagogy, which is a historical truth, um, was just to say uh, that our are because the purpose of education is always primary. So, what's the purpose of edu- education? Well, it's 
it's knowledge transmission, it's the passing on of our culture. Those are the primary things, whereas pedagogy takes a, an essential but secondary place in that, that the methodology has to conform with the purpose of education. That was my point. I wasn't saying that you we shouldn't care about pedagogy. I'm just saying in when, when we start out to talk about this, we need to recognize that that the content is is the most important thing, and uh, and and the the pedagogy is essential and has to be in conformity with that, which Morgan, I think you would agree with. He just said pedagogy is essential. Yes, yes, he did. But I would like to challenge one thing that he said there, which not challenge as much as nuance. No, go ahead, challenge. When when you said. Classical educators didn't care about pedagogy. I think what you mean by that mm -hmm. is that it wasn't a topic of conversation because there was a recognized typical way that this stuff was done. Yes, that's the other aspect of the hit historically is they there were no differences in pedagogy. There were everyone agreed you should memorize and drill and do all those things. So there really wasn't a debate about this up until the late nineteenth century when when Dewey comes along. Uh, who's who's coming in the uh, the the whole mo uh, psychological movement and everything starts turning psychological and turning to the how. Uh, so you do find it. I mean, if if you want a classical pedagogy, the place to start is Quintilian's uh, book one of his Institutes. He talks, but it's all pretty basic, and nobody would really do, nobody at that time would have disagreed with him. Now we have all these disagreements, and we have people coming to us, which was my purpose in saying what I said. Uh, which who think that that uh, pedagogy is primary, that content is not the primary thing, and they're not focused on passing on content. They're they're focused on these psychological issues with children and child development and all these. They're not focused on passing on a culture. That's what I meant. Not that pedagogy is not important. And now we have to defend classical pedagogy against people who have a different kind of pedagogy. Which is hard to do when you're running around saying it's not important. <laughs> Martin, do you think that uh, some of your concern comes from the fact that some people, you know, with, with good-hearted intentions, if asked, what is classical education, mm -hmm. they would respond and say, well, it's the fact that w when you first start learning something, there's the grammar of that thing. And then after that, it, there's the rhetoric of that thing, or the logic of that thing, then the rhetoric of it. They automatically define classical education in terms of Sayers trivium, right. that, that, which is, and that is was the problem. We, the we had to the first. That's the first thing we had to do with this movement is we had to say that Dorothy Sayers' stages of learning, which she was using pedagogically, and then saying in that original essay that that was the sum and substance of education. That that was a mistake. We had to reorient people to say this movement. Is, is is those are helpful, and I've said it before. Those are helpful things. Those are great things. But the primary purpose, the end which those things serve, is is saving Western civilization one child at a time. Uh, that's all I'm saying. So we we have to have the pedagogy go along with the purpose. Another question along those lines would be that when we talk about the Memoria Press kind of identity, we use the terms classical Christian and traditional, and we seem to separate those. Obviously, they're intertwined and interrelated. How does traditional play into this conversation of when we're talking about what it means to have a classical pedagogy? Well, I, th I think traditional is is the 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 main thrust of that sort of pillar, if you will, is is very much driven towards the pedagogical, right? Whereas classical, we're really talking more about content, right? And so traditional is where we say we're going to present that content in a in a structured, orderly environment that is in accord with the traditional understanding of the child, not the modern one that tends to think that a five-year-old is a fully formed adult who can make their own choices. Um, Teacher-directed you know. rather than child-directed. Yeah, and Cheryl, Cheryl O would, would always, she would, she would actually break this down. She said the term classical, the term traditional, and the term modern or progressive. She would always make a distinction between traditional and and classical. Now, it just so happens that all the classical pedagogy was, in fact, traditional, but uh, they, they had two different connotations with a lot of people, which is why she she would break those down like that. Yeah. So coming back to 
classical pedagogy, we, we've kind of said a, a few times that there is this way that we think is the best to convey these ideas, this content that is classical education. Why is that way classical? What What is the grounds by which we point to certain kinds of pedagogy, teacher-directed memorization and say, this is the correct way for teaching your students in this tradition of education? Well, I, I mean, I, I would say that um, that the, you know, we, we, we want to pass on are a set of knowledge and a cultural knowledge and a set of cultural values to our children. So how do you do that? And one of my quibbles with the whole, with the pedagogy thing was just to say, uh, as I said in an article I did, you know, uh, uh, teaching is a science, but it's not rocket science. You don't have to go to a teacher's college and learn pedagogy for however long you do that and think that you've you've now become an equipped, fully equipped educator. Most classical pedagogy is just common sense, but the problem is we forgot about common sense, so we've now got to come back and say, this is common sense pedagogy. You don't need to know Piaget. You don't, don't need to know um, Benjamin Bloom. You don't need to, it's just, it's just common sense. This is how you pass on these things. It, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. And it's been, you know, you wrote all those articles years ago about, you know, the history of it all and Cotton Mather and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it stands on a long history, mm -hmm. the traditional classroom. It, this new progressive classroom, it is new. The tradition would be the traditional classroom that we would say is the best way to learn. Yeah, modern modern education programs are 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 trying to make teachers into amateur psychologists, and you don't need to be an amateur psychologist to teach traditionally. Well, and and, and I think our 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 classical pedagogy, if, if if you want to say that, is coming precisely out of this idea of passing on things. Right. I I once had a conversation with a friend who she was a teacher at a local public school. And we were talking about how we teach our students. And, and she said, well, I find, she was teaching math. She said, I find that my students actually learn best from one another. So I put them in small groups and then they, you know, they kind of teach each other. And I, and I just kind of looked at her and I said, I think you and I conceptualize of education in diametrically opposed ways. Because for me, education is like, it's a chain. And, and, you know, we're, we have all of this information coming down this chain and every, every link in that chain is, is somebody, some teacher who's then passing that on to the students who are linked below them. And if I pull myself out of that, the students can't be connected to the rest of that chain because I'm the one passing that on. I love that visual. Thank you're the, you. You're the missing link. And well, <laughs> 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 if I pull myself out of it, I'm missing. Hopefully, I'm the I'm the present link, right? <laughs> he, he may have just called you subhuman. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but but I I think because we envision education as that that passing on, it does dictate the way we run that classroom or the way that we teach an individual student if that's our child in a homeschool, right? And I do agree that the that. Most if if people major in education, they are getting they're getting all that pedagogy, but they aren't getting content. They're not getting content. And I think when Cheryl trained me to teach, she gave me both. Content was central, but the way that I imparted that content to my students was also central. I mean, I think you just have to have both. But if you don't. If you don't if you don't have the content and you're not teaching content then it doesn't really matter how you how you do it because you're not you're not passing anything on. Mm -hmm. But but the other thing is and you know I, I think we can get into some traits of classical pedagogy here but you know uh, so let's say that that the purpose is for you as a teacher to teach these children a set of uh, teach these children a set of knowledge right? Okay, so you ask how you do that. Well, do you do it with the desks facing each other, or do you do it with the desks facing the front? Well, unless Johnny is getting this transmitted to him by his fellow student, this knowledge, 
then the facing each other desks do not make sense. Uh, Jordan Peterson talks about this. He's, he's, he talks about frames, and he's he's in a lecture hall and he's talking to uh, uh, an, an audience of students, and he says this building tells you what to do. Okay, one of the things that indicates what you should do is how the seats, where the seats are directed. Where are all the seats in this lecture hall directed? They literally are directed right. To, they're directed to me. I'm the speaker. I'm the one doing the transmitting. I'm the one passing on. So how you set up desks in your class tells you tells the children what to do. So if they're fac- facing each other, and I I we I went to one school, and sure enough, in this class they were converting over from a progressive school to a traditional school, classical school. And so I go in there, and well, the desks are facing each other. There's two desks here, two desks here, two desks here, and this, this, the the teacher spent half her time trying to get them not to talk. Well, what are the desks telling them to do? They're telling them to talk to each other. Okay. Whereas if you face them forward, those desks are telling you that it's the teacher who's the focus of this. This is the per- person conducting the education, passing on the knowledge, that sort of thing. So I'll just no. give that as an example. So Tanya, when Martin forgets to take his medication and he says <laughs> things like pedagogy isn't important, yes. you react pretty strongly to that. What are the things that you're, you've seen over the years that make you concerned about that kind, like a misunderstanding of classical pedagogy? And it, it's exactly like Martin said. The When we visit classrooms, I mean, it is just night and day. I don't think anybody that visited a traditional classroom and then visited the same subject being taught in a progressive classroom would have any doubt about which one is getting the job done, which one is actually imparting the knowledge. And the, that progressive classroom just makes me crazy. When the, If the teacher doesn't have control, the students are speaking on top of each other, on top of the teacher. Nothing is happening. Or even just, I've been in classrooms where they're just reading aloud say the Blue Fairy book, they're all reading together a chapter. If they're all sitting at their desks, reading around the room, everybody is focused on the reading, the teacher is up front making sure everybody's tracking along, calling on students to read, engaged with the students. But in the in a class, I've been, I mean, the worst was this classroom that had pillows <laughs> and the students would lie down like literally lie down on the pillows and hold the book up and hit each other and the book had like a bookmark like a ribbon and they would be flapping it or one of them got under a table and was spent the entire reading time trying to get himself comfortable under that table and it was just, I mean, it was just a nightmare. I doubt anybody knew what was going on in that chapter. They were having a really good time, but at the end of the day, they were getting very little information. We, we just weren't doing our, we're not doing our jobs. And, and the thing is, they, the, the education establishment that pushes this kind of stuff knows this, knows this. They know what works. And the reason we know this, I, just to give you an example, I was in a, uh, professional development when they were doing this in Kentucky in the early 90s and I went to this professional development session the state was putting on and the lady got up there and she said now how do how do how do people really learn she said when you you learn how how do you do it i mean do you do you have sit on a desk under phosphorescent lights listening to a lecture or do you lay down on the couch with a soft light, maybe with some music playing, reading a novel. And I, I leaned over to the person next to me and I said, look around the room. She was doing exactly the thing that she was condemning. She was up there giving a lecture <laughs> under, with everyone sitting in straight rows of desks under phosphorescent lights. They, 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 they know this. I was at another session with a classical friend of mine talking about the whole day a uh, seminar on Socratic teaching. And um, he came up to me afterwards. He said, well, what'd you think? I said, well, I just thought it was interesting that in your entire day talking about Socratic teaching, it was all lecture. <laughs> you know, we know really what works. And when sure. they try to do something, they do it in a way that they know works, but they tell everybody else to do something different. Why? Because of their own uh, 
philosophical predilections. On, it just is on, crazy to me. I just think it's yeah. so obvious. It's so obvious that you're going to get more done in an ordered environment. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, with but, the teacher in charge, right? And and I think the sort of the the people in the classical movement that would critique this, the way we're talking about this, right? Teacher at the front, teacher giving a lecture, teacher, you know, telling, passing on this knowledge, right? They're going to, they're going to stop and they're going to critique and they're going to say, Hey, but wait, we need to discuss, right? The students need to discuss, they need to talk and they need, they need to learn to process information. They need to learn to, to make arguments Mm -hmm. and things like that. Right. Right. And the reality is that in our teacher-directed classrooms, our students are doing that all the time. Yes. Right? It, it's not an either or. It's not that they have to be in a circle because they need to discuss with each other and we need to pull that teacher out of the way. But know that the teacher is helping direct this conversation so that the teacher can pull that student out that doesn't want to talk and make them talk. And that, that when the student responds, the teacher can then say, okay, who else wants to respond to that student? Or if that's going off track, can redirect it where it needs to go, right? And so that that is is something that it's it's not like you know it, it's it's just not a either or it's it's a it's a both and and that you can be structured, you can be orderly, the teacher can have control of the classroom and be fostering this discussion, and and I think. Uh, I was hoping you'd ask me what you asked Tanya about, you know, issues in pedagogy, right? And and I've seen I've seen the kids laying on the pillows under their desk trying to read, and I've seen, you know, a lot more besides. But in the classical world, I think we struggle with this idea that is still you, Martin mentioned that we had to kind of clarify with the Sayers thing and the grammar, logic, and rhetoric. But some people still are seeing those as very independent stages. Right. So they do nothing in K to five to encourage deeper thought. This purely memorization. And then they hit sixth or seventh grade and they're like, okay, all of a sudden I want you to write a five page paper giving an argument of this stuff. Right. Right. And 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 that also is totally non classical because it's not it's not it's not continuous. Right. right? Yeah, and and you know it is a and it, it's a it's a shifting spectrum <laughs> as you go up and you have to do it in a way where you're shifting slowly. I mean, even even at the lower level where we have very structured classrooms and a teacher up in front, the teacher's still asking the students questions. If you go into our room, they're saying, well, so what does Charlotte mean when she says thus and so? I mean, right. and then, and you do more of that as you go up. And it's not, and it, it's also not that, you know, uh, here at Highlands, we have, you know, we have, uh, um, you know, we have desks in all our classrooms, even in the high school, and they're mature students, and they know how to discuss whatever the the environment is. If you go back to the frames thing, then you could ask, well, if you do want discussion in your classrooms, what are the desks telling you to do? Um, whereas if you have like a, a table or something, as some schools do, uh, that's fine. But the problem, the problem, and I think Cheryl was, this is why Cheryl did it this way, is because the temptation is always to veer off into the 1960s uh, and, 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 and put the chairs in a circle and you got an encounter group, you know? Uh, so it, it's and, just, and the teacher she was, was really one more student in that encounter group. Yeah. And, and right. And so she was really concerned because that temptation, it was right in the middle of the reforms here. And, and she said the very picture, the very image of the progressive school is a teacher sitting down on the floor with her students. That is the, that's the the branding label for that, and well, she just detested that, yeah, and she I did totally just violated. Yeah. But but you know, so some schools, it's not wrong for a high school if you've got trained students, mature students. Uh, the, the nice thing here is that we've got students we've had for twelve years or however long you know. Um, but uh, you know, there's there's schools that do there's classical schools that do this, and they and they do it right. But you've got to be very careful. And Cheryl just wanted to be very vigilant about this. Well, and the image that came to mind when you talked about the teacher sitting on the floor with her with her students is our kindergarten, first and second grade teachers when they when they do a read aloud, mm-hmm. the teacher will sit in a chair, which is which is a regular adult sized chair, and the kids will in sit around her in the center, you know, listening to this read aloud book. But the teacher is up. And mm-hmm. they're all focused yes. on her. Yeah. So even in a dis- even in a Socratic discussion, uh, there there mm-hmm. were there were debates about this in the Great Books Movement uh, in the in the fifties and sixties about how to do that, and and it was between people who thought they are just facilitators and they're just trying to keep the the conversation you know coherent, and then there was others who said no, 
the the instructor is helping to guide the people there. If you go back and you Socratic discussion, hmm, does Socrates play a role in that term? <laughs> All right, you go back and you look at Socrates. He was in control of the conversation. Okay, you've got to be in control of the conversation. So even if you, so that 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 makes it harder when you do have a conference table to make that happen, uh, which is another one of the reasons I think Cheryl, you know, was careful of that. Uh, but you get in that situation, you got to be a teacher with a strong personality, and you've got to guide that discussion. And it's really it, it's such an easy slide down off of that. It is. It is. Um, that standard. So mm -hmm. I do think that even though by the time our students are in high school, they certainly can sit around a table like this sure. and discuss. Mm -hmm. But once you start that, it it's a slippery slope mm -hmm. then to a it, more it, progressive. It, just because it's such a powerful, less teacher directed, such a powerful force mm -hmm. in our education world, and you've got to take precautions against that. Yeah, and and education is about formation. Right, right, and if and if the students are allowed to go do whatever you know, have a have a conversation. I was just talking to a, a teacher who he said somebody subbed for him for a couple of weeks, and that teacher was having them sit in in, in a circle. And he comes back, and and the teachers thought, and the kids were asking, "Well, can we? That was really fun. Can we sit in a circle?" And and I and kind of what occurred to me was like, "Well, it's it, it's because it's easier for the student. They're not being formed. They're not being forced out of their comfort zones." Their, their conversation is not being driven by that master teacher. And so it's just easier to sit in that circle. Yeah, and and, and I, I think the problem that we have is trying to explain to classical educators who do have a traditional view and classical view about these things to cook up that view with the pedagogy. They have to understand the relation between that sort of thing. So you you just articulated the the classical vision of, you know, you, you said formation. H.I. Uh, Maru's favorite quote from – uh, education in antiquity. The aim of education was the formation of adults, not the development of children. Those that that right there delineates those mm -hmm. those two emphases. So, if you believe that it is the formation of adults, what does that imply for your psychology? And that's what we try to we have to try to get teachers to understand. Connect those things together. Let's Connect dive, your philosophy with your pedagogy. Into that a little more specifically, we. On this podcast before, and then just when we, the four of us are talking in various capacities, we, I think often because it's so visually distinct and easy to talk about, we talk about ordered rows, a teacher up front, but I have a list in front of me that I think this is from this Lilo. Is mm -hmm. um, she gave this to the HLS teachers in, in a talk, and she has one column that is the marks of classical education, and then another column that are the marks of progressive education. There's a few of these that we've talked about. There's some that strike me as different or ones that we don't talk about often. So I'm going to mention a mark of the classical education and then it's contrasting mark of progressive education next to each other. And I'd be interested to hear you, you guys explain why and how these look in the classroom. So, I'm anxious to see which ones you pick. <laughs> well, the first one that stands out to me is humility. So the mark of a classical education, one of the marks, according to Lilo, is humility. The mark on the progressive side is expertise, one who knows more and more about less and less. What does it mean for a traditional classroom, a classical classroom, to have a teacher or a classroom embodied by the character of humility? I, I love that you picked that one. Um, when when I got married, my my wife was very adamant that most of the people she was meeting in the classical education movement were absolutely arrogant. Who was? <laughs> you weren't around, Shane, so I'm just going to, uh, you know, excuse you from that. Um, must have been me then. Well, oh, but been. it wasn't just here in this building, you know, so we were taking right. trips and stuff like that. And, um, and she was, she, I mean, she was absolutely right because we, uh, we have this great temptation, right? If it's the teacher who's passing it on, then the teacher is the one that's right, right? And and the student is the one that has to conform to it, which by and large is what we want. But you like if you walk into any of our classrooms, you will see almost in every single class a student ask something and a teacher go, hmm. I don't know if that derivative actually comes from that word or if it's coming from the Greek. Let me look that up. Let me come back and let me give you the right answer. You know, and so there's that posture of, yeah, I'm passing on what I know, but I also know what I don't know. 
and um and i i think that's just the you know that attitude is fundamental to a healthy learning environment instead of you know all i know what to talk about is you know i don't know uh, all i know is my my little domain of math and i don't know how that connects to anything else but that's but that's what i'm going to teach you um that's what we don't want a classical or classroom. let me tell you the p- correct definition for all of these terms and it's different than maybe the one you assumed but i'm going to give you the correct definition or this is the correct way to read history in this particular way mm-hmm. and you have to mm-hmm. read it that way as well right. i think that but would mark our classroom i think it's ironic that we're uh, we're sounding arrogant talking about <laughs> traditional classroom right like we know better than everybody else yeah. and then you pick humility well, also, you know, it's I think for that, the good of the students. <laughs> I mean, the thing of the expert, I, I think, you know, because I think teachers are trained to think that there's some kind of educational technician. And really, that's that's not what you are. You are there to to pass on this tradition that has been given to us. We're not we're not we're not here to um, to you know, have a teacher up in front of the room who thinks that they uh, have all the answers and they're passing. No, it's the tradition. We should all be be humble before the tradition. Well, and that, this 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 arrogant thing, you know, and it's us being arrogant about them about standing as us telling you the right way to be <laughs> to teach, right? Like, I think that there's there's this this fine line between being arrogant and and which means you're not going to accept somebody coming up and challenging you on what you believe, right? Versus, you know, if somebody brought us to a progressive school and it was happening and we could see progressive school after progressive school after progressive school teaching this content. And would, getting it done. And getting it mm-hmm. done. Would we be able to say, you know what? There's something here. There is another way. There is another way. We just way. haven't seen but that we yet. Just, we've been to <laughs> progressive school after progressive school and not seen that. Right. Right. And so, you know, we would we would love for somebody, like, I don't know, we wouldn't love it, but would we be humble enough to, to say, you know what, I was wrong about that because I've seen it done And, and you, know, you will see that every once in a while. It, this is the thing. There are some teachers out there who are just really gifted, and they can get up it's there true. and completely have those those kids in the palm of their hand, and they can go all, way off the rails mm-hmm. in in proper pedagogy as we as we conceive it, and they can they can achieve in their classrooms, but the, um, but um, it's rare. Well, it is, and and Jacques Barzun says this is one of the three fallacies of modern education: is that you can take this. What this one gifted teacher is doing, and you can can it, mm-hmm. and everybody can do it. They, they, they're constantly they, making yeah. that mistake. So, so sometimes it works, but you have to have a very, very gifted teacher. And the, mm-hmm. the thing is, very few of us are can that do gifted. that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we're saying that we can take what we're doing, and everybody can do it, but we're not trying to replicate what the gifted teacher can do. Well, we're saying the gifted teacher might do have a little bit that can, more leeway mm-hmm. because that teacher is getting it done in a way that maybe isn't traditional. And I have mm-hmm. seen those teachers. Yeah, there, there's just this 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 um, this factor that you can't quantify. It's like it's like okay, I'm going to have a quarterback do everything that Jim Brady does. Well, you could find uh, a guy who does exactly does. His name but Tom. I'm sorry, his name's Tom. Uh, I, I knew that. I'm talking about Jim Jim Brady. <laughs> Chris the, uh, Colley would player. be so <laughs> no. proud yeah, Tom of Brady, me. Oh, oh, okay. I'm going to get grief from that for my children too. I hope you well, caught that, Chris. And, and, and that Tanya <laughs> caught it. Well, so, I know. It's really good. You don't know anything <laughs> about that. I just assumed he was a quarterback in the 1930s. Okay, we, were, just we were talking about humility. I feel very <laughs> humiliated right now that she knew that. And I didn't. Okay, so Tom Brady. I'm sorry. Tom Brady, I've been studying my football can, book. Okay, my point has been lost. Sorry. Uh, and the point no, was. No, I do think, though. Can I finish my point? Oh, well, I thought you were done. Golly, you're just going <laughs> on and on and on. Okay, finish. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 Jim Brady, the tennis player. Uh, Tom Brady. <laughs> Tom Brady. Okay, you can have somebody do technically everything Tom Brady does, and they will never achieve what Tom Brady, because there's this, there's this unquantifiable factor there. That's what I'm saying. There's some people are like that, and you can't can that. So... To take that one step further, as a school administrator, you can't assume that your teachers are capable of doing that. So that's why you have to have this standard 
because it's going to be rare that you have a teacher that can hold a class in the palm of his hand with total chaos going around him. Right. All right. Another item on the list under classical education is knowledge-based. Our classrooms are knowledge-based, but a progressive classroom would be skills-based or functional. What does Lee mean by that? Like vocational training versus training the person to be a whole person. I think it also has to do with what your goal is, right? So, you know, all the, every public school in the United States has to meet uh, standards that have been defined for that grade level. And if you go read that, it might be something like be able to engage with the text at a fourth grade level. Well, it's very, it's very ethereal, but, but there's nothing in there that says in fourth grade, they need to learn their states and capitals and of all 50 states. And they need to learn, you know, um, I don't know the, the history of their state for the past 200 years. It's not quantify. It's, it, 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 the goal isn't that knowledge. The goal is to meet those mm -hmm. skill-based standards, which are very ethereal. Right. Well, see, because what has happened is in the in modern education, uh, particularly at the state levels where these standards are set, is they they what they do is they go into all the disciplines that have been we've spent hundreds of years putting together. Right. Geography, history, all those, and they 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 try to determine what skills. They think that's the important thing. What skills are being taught? And they 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 just take the disciplines apart and put them into lists of the skills learned in that discipline. And then they put these things and make them state state uh, uh, standards documents. Well, that doesn't help you to take the thing apart that you're using. All right, that, that actually makes things worse. So that's where all this critical thinking skills stuff and, and idea finding and all these these mental critical thinking skills come from because that's the excuse they always have. Well, why aren't we teaching our kids, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, history facts or you know, facts about literature, whatever it is. And they always say, oh, that's because we're trying to teach them critical thinking skills. I think that's what Lee means by skills there. Well, no, we're not. And And how do you teach them if you've taken the subject part that teaches them the right way, you know? I feel like this, I agree with all of that, but I do think, too, that there's this thought that we, in school, and we've talked about this before, you know, that we have our STEM children, and we have our liberal arts children, and we're not merging all of that together. I think that's, to me, the skill-based, like, you're in a track, and so you're not educating the whole person you're just sending them off to be an engineer if in a, at, when they're eight, they have an interest in math. Well, and, and the, I'm oh, sorry, but I feel like that's a whole, that's a different thing well, that you, you said, all are talking about. You said whole person. And the, the irony is that this is an expression the progressives use all the time. Oh, We're teaching sorry. the whole child. They're, they're, but what you mean by it is the true meaning of it. We're trying to, 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 to develop better human beings. Yes. Good citizens. Right. And, and moral people. And the assumption is that we have to specialize. That's another thing that that modern education is specialization. Whereas, you know, education until the college or graduate school level needs to be a general education. This we is, need to be we're all citizens, as Adler said, and we're all philosophers. So those are the two things we need to train everybody at before we go on to specialize. And this is the this is I'm just it just hit me. This is the thing that Cheryl Lowe said in that church basement when I was looking for an alternative education for my children. That is exactly what she said that that caught me and I never let go was that just that training of the I won't say whole person. What should I say? The human being. The human the, being. The human soul. Um, and the, and she said, you know, if you do that, then it doesn't matter what if they go off to be a fireman or a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher, whatever. They're going as a complete human being, and they will be ethical, and they will be compassionate and empathetic. And I mean, it was just that is the thing that got me. I knew nothing about classical education. Yeah, but just that idea that your children could become something really Jesus-like, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's what what it is. Well, and, and this, this whole fallacy, the STEM fallacy, really. Uh, My which children is, did not become Jesus-like, by the way. 
Um, I tried. Yeah, well, they were homeschooled, I understand. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, This idea that in order to be good at any particular thing, you have to specialize in it, Mm. that that's the best Mm. training for it. And that is, that is definitively not the case. Right. We know that. And, and yet it's, it's, uh, it's repeated again. It's the same thing with technology. Mm. Yep. Is we haven't talked about technology in the classroom, Mm. but at least said at this same teacher meeting where Mm. she did this, she said, Students are probably not going to go home and read Macbeth. I don't know if she said Macbeth, but you know they're not going to go home and read Shakespeare or whatever. They are going to go home and get on their computers. Mm-hmm. So is the best use of our class time to spend it on computers? No. We've got to spend it on the things that they need, that they can't miss. Can I comment on that? I'm sorry to say. Uh, well, and the thing is— Are you that, still here? That I'm here. I'm, listening. Uh, I'm loving this. A, a lot of the people— who are pushing? Yeah, we're not debating enough that we're agreeing. No, I know too uh, much agreement has been a problem, but <laughs> we'll be hugging soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, um, but th- this this I- this idea that that we need more technology in our classrooms. What people don't realize is that the, this is part of the progressivist agenda because they want to sideline the teacher. They they want these teachers patrolling a room full of children who are working on their Chromebooks. That t- com- now the computer is 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 the is the focus. Now the computer is teaching the child, and this is very explicit. Larry Cuban is one of the people who writes about this. He's a progressive, and he's disappointed that we haven't sidelined the teachers enough with this technology. I and mean, this is this is part of the program. And this is I just when I'm in those classrooms, I just I mean I literally want to jump out the window. <laughs> it doesn't matter what floor I'm on. I just can't stand it. I actually have a testimonial on this point and I might embarrass him, but it's all for a good cause. So we have an intern in my office this summer named Thomas Spurlock. And he's a great kid and he's an HLS grad and he's doing an amazing job. He's done a great job for the things he's done for me. But what's funny is that he's an HLS grad. So he doesn't need to know how to type and he's a philosophy <laughs> major. He doesn't know anything about technology. So I said to him at the beginning he of the was, summer, he was a great philosophy student, by the way, I said, young Thomas, just for 15 minutes when you get in the morning, do this typing class online. It's free. Just do that. And so you can type. In two weeks, he mastered it. And now he's typing and oh, that doing all so the things funny. really well. That you don't need so to learn funny. typing to be, you need a 15 minute course, you know, right. for two That's weeks. Right. <laughs> You'll be fine. That's right. 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 So the last thing I wanted to talk about on this sheet is uh, Lee has on here for a classical education we distinguish man and God distinguishes man and God. And on a progressive side is pursues utopia. I, I wasn't sure what she was getting at on that. So I wanted to hear what, what, she, what you guys thought. I think progressivism is progressivism is explicitly utopian. I mean, th- this, this is, this is Thomas soul pointed this out. This can you, is the can division. you define that term? Utopian? I'm, I'm on my way to do okay. that. Okay. Um, uh, that that um, he has that, so many words. <laughs> uh, Thomas Sowell's got a great book called uh, "The Vision of the Anointed," where he talks about how the chief dividing factor in how people think about the world is whether you think that human beings are perfectible hmm. or whether they're inherently corrupted. And he said you can track the, their position on every issue is somehow strangely consistent, and it's strangely consistent because. That's the central belief is what, what, where you stand on the perfectibility of human beings. And progressivism is perfectible. I mean, which is part of the reason why they want to emphasize the indi- – they, they say the whole child. They mean – what they mean is the individual child. Mm-hmm. Everything is individuating. It's about that particular child. And and it's this whole modern idea that we're – we don't need to um, – to try to stifle the impulses of children. We need, to, we need to let them individually be what they are. Well, no. I mean, if you believe human beings are perfectible, you're going to want to do that, and all your pedagogy is going to be tied to that. But if you believe that, that, that we're human beings and we're sinful, then we're going to have a completely different pedagogy, and it's going to involve order and all these sorts of things in the classroom. Well, and if you, if you believe that we are all sinners, then you're going to insist on a formation. Mm-hmm. If you don't believe that we're all sinners, if you believe that we have this innate inherent goodness that if we can just let it out, then you're not gonna you're not gonna feel the need to form them. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I do think that there's a there's a balance there. You can, you know, uh, form somebody while still recognizing their individual qualities. Um, but but that 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 fundamental assumption of of who man is 
and and distinguishing between man and God in our relationship, therefore to to a higher power who is perfect and we are not, is going to define how we educate. Which which is what we mean by formation that we do have an idea of what the ideal human being is. But no, no, and nobody's ever going to be that except for one person in the, in the history of the world. But we know that form. We know that ideal. And so it's that very Aristotelian idea that we are trying to, to bring all of our students to a, a closer approximation to that ideal human being. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation about classical pedagogy. And you haven't it talked is. very much. So I appreciate it. Well, I have, <laughs> I've just been on the sidelines watching a prize fight between two great fighters <laughs> duking it out. We didn't duke it out, though. We were in agreement. Yeah. I just needed him to clarify. For the rest of the world, I need a <laughs> clarification that pedagogy is important. All right. Consider and, it clarified. And I have a pedagogy class where I go over all this. Yes. From Memorial College. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Classical Etc. If you'd like to show your support for the show, then you can leave a like below. If you'd like to add your voice to the conversation, then you can comment. And if you want to follow along with us on this journey, then please subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you later.